Welcome to the American Citizens Abroad podcast. I'm Michelle, and today I'm speaking with Nina Olson, the Executive Director of the Center for Taxpayer Rights. Welcome, Nina. We're thrilled to have you join us today. Well, thank you for having me. I imagine that many of our listeners know who you are, but for those who may not know, could you please tell us a bit about yourself? What organizations have you been a part of, and what got you interested in advocating for taxpayers? Well, you know, my background is in fine arts, so that's an odd place to get started. But in order to keep myself alive while I was painting, I got into tax preparation. And then one thing led to another and eventually I had my own little tax prep business. And then I went to law school at night because I sort of was seeing all my clients having some problems and I couldn't represent them before the IRS. And then eventually I got my master's of law in taxation. And about that time as a lawyer, people approached me to do pro bono work. And I thought, well, my whole background is tax. So I founded the first low income taxpayer clinic in the country, the community tax law project that wasn't affiliated with a law or accounting school. And From there, one thing led to another. I testified before Congress during the Restructuring Act of 1998, and that led to when the NTA position, the National Taxpayer Advocacy position came open, that led to IRS offering it to me. Most of my work has been in the controversy area, tax controversy representing taxpayers before the IRS and the tax court on collection and audit matters and appeals. That's sort of where the focus has been. And then certainly focusing on taxpayer rights. That's always been the context of the work that I've done. You served for 18 years as a national taxpayer advocate. Could you tell us more about your work in that position? What challenges and achievements did you experience? The national taxpayer advocate's a creature of statute. Congress has directed that the taxpayer advocate help taxpayers solve their problems with the IRS and also make legislative and administrative recommendations to mitigate those problems. And part of how you do that is you have the Taxpayer Advocate Service where there's at least one office in every single state. We can come back to that in terms of international taxpayers. And certainly as part of the IRS by law, you're mandated to be a direct report to the commissioner, but you're appointed by the Secretary of the Treasury So the commissioner himself or herself can't fire you. It has to convince the secretary that you should be removed. And obviously, I had lived through several commissioner's terms and secretary terms and presidential terms. So I was still there when I decided to retire. I think in terms of the challenges, the challenge is that you are supposed to be an advocate for taxpayers inside the IRS. And the IRS is a very insular organization and has a lot of responsibilities and is constantly under pressure and frankly doesn't take dissent or critiquing well. There are times when you've done your advocacy inside the building and if you're a good advocate, you have to make the decision to go outside the building and highlight the issue. And that creates tensions no matter However you do it, you're always going to be subject to criticism within the building. I always have a hard time identifying successes when I was in the job because I was always focusing on the very next issue. You didn't have the luxury to sit back and think about these things, but I've had at least a year to think about some of these things. And I think certainly the Taxpayer Bill of Rights was an incredible achievement to get that through and then to ultimately get it codified into law. And we don't know what exactly it means. As I said, the day after we got the IRS to adopt it now begins the really hard work to make this meaningful. I think the Taxpayer First Act, which was enacted on July 1st, 2019, right before I retired, it contained about 21 of the legislative recommendations I'd made over the years. And it's really quite rewarding to see in a package Finally, some of your life's work actually become law. I think expanding offices, making the local offices smaller, but increasing the number of them throughout the United States is important. And I also think getting the taxpayer advocate oversees a panel called the Taxpayer Advocacy Panel, which is a volunteer, you know, a federal advisory committee of of volunteer citizens who advise the IRS on taxpayer service matters. 
and adding an international member, a member to represent the U.S. citizens abroad and other U.S. taxpayers, international U.S. taxpayers, individuals, was a very important move. And the only thing that I do regret, well, there are a lot that I regret, but one thing that I regret that's of relevance to ACA is that as the IRS eliminated the tax attaches for offices that were remaining several years ago abroad, we had put together a proposal that TAS would open up some local taxpayer advocate offices abroad, that even if you just had a local taxpayer advocate and a staff assistant and the cases were worked in the United States, but you had a person being the advocates for people in you know, like one for Europe, one for Asia, one for Africa, one for South America, that would at least be some presence and really heighten some of the concerns. And we were never able to quite pull that off while I was there, not for lack of trying, but just because some of the insurmountable logistics and the funding and things like that. Could you tell our listeners who may not know about the Center for Taxpayer Rights? What's the organization's mission? So the Center for Taxpayer Rights is a nonprofit that I started after I retired on July 31st, 2019. There wasn't much of a lag time there. It really is a nonprofit dedicated to promoting taxpayer rights, both in the United States and around the world, and try to educate both taxpayers, their representatives, and also governments and tax administrations about the importance of taxpayer rights. And some of the ways to improve the protections and improve administrative and legislative and judicial procedures to protect taxpayer rights. What inspired you to found the center? I was thinking about what I wanted to do in the next phase of life, and I certainly had already decided that I never wanted to represent another taxpayer myself ever again. (laughs) I'd spent my life either representing taxpayers as clients or advocating on behalf of their individual cases as well as systemic issues. And I just didn't want to do that. But I did want to continue some of the work that I'd been doing as the taxpayer advocate. And I thought about the things that I liked the most about the job and just said, well, they can go into a nonprofit and I can continue to do them and we'll see what happens. So that's where it came out. And we'll talk later about the international conference. But the primary vehicle I thought would make sense is to have the center sponsor and organize the International Conference on Taxpayer Rights. It was always a difficult fit with the Taxpayer Advocate Service doing it. And with the federal budget being as it is, it was always a battle being able to pull that off. And the contracting and everything like that was just complex. So it just made so much more sense to have it be completely independent. So that sort of became the starting point for the center and the other things I just added because they made sense coming from that. What is the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic Support Center? In 1992, I founded the Community Tax Law Project, which was a low income taxpayer clinic in Virginia that covered all of Virginia and represented low income taxpayers pro bono with volunteers or myself or a staff attorney that we had. And before I became the National Taxpayer Advocate, it had always been my plan to create a national law center for the clinics. Once 1998 had funded, created the clinic funding program, the grant program for clinics, I really felt like there needed to be a national support center for them, like you have the National Immigration Law Center or the National Center on Homelessness and Poverty or the National Consumer Law Center, which both might do high impact litigation, but also does reports or studies, just provides a vehicle for support for the clinics. And so that seemed to be a good fit to pick this up after leaving the IRS to pick up something that I was planning to do in 2000 before I became the NTA in 2001 and just take those 18 years and put them aside and pick it back up again in the support center. Some of what we've been doing is holding a litigation strategy call with about 40 of the clinics around the country to really work on issues where a coordinated litigation strategy would make sense. IRS chief counsel, on certain issues, they coordinate litigation strategy throughout the United States in the chief counsel office. 
and they have resources given to those attorneys we felt we should be leveling the playing field a little bit and start thinking about what issues can we bring up in a coordinated fashion in different circuits throughout the country to get some judicial attention to some matters that we think we have problems. And in fact, we've been very, very successful from these calls. A lot of the strategy with the CARES Act some of the cases that have changed forced the IRS to change its actions and its approaches in implementing the economic impact payments have come through participants on these phone calls. There have been several really fascinating and I think far-reaching litigating successes, including just in the last month, the class action suit about giving the economic impact payment to incarcerated persons which the IRS determined was not something that they were going to do, even though there is no no provision in law that allows them the choice. And in fact, a judge very much agreed, certified a nationwide class of federal, state, and local persons who'd been incarcerated and granted a permanent injunction against the IRS denying these payments, ordering the IRS to issue them. And they're under the gun this week And they've already updated their guidance to employees now. It looks like they have decided not to appeal, but we'll have to see. But anyway, that kind of litigation going on, while the center doesn't represent the clients themselves, the center is the vehicle for helping people talk through some of those challenges, the best litigating strategy, consult with experts, pull people together, and sort of have the wisdom of crowds in a way to help us identify the arguments, and then those people can bring cases as appropriate. According to your site, the center submits amicus curiae briefs to, quote, alert the court of the consequences of the government's position on low income and other vulnerable taxpayers, unquote. Could you tell us more about the briefs that have been recently filed, and do you have any updates on any of them? As I said, I personally didn't want to represent any taxpayers myself, but we think that there's a role as a friend of the court, which is what amicus curiae means, a friend of the court, to raise certain issues that the parties themselves may not raise, or they may not be able to present them with a particular slant that we might have. They may be raising other an issue with other concerns, and we're going to always be coming in for taxpayer rights concerns, or in particular, What's the impact of these cases on low-income taxpayers? Because often the people before the court are not low-income taxpayers. And so a court may look at an issue that involves a multinational corporation and not think that it might have impact on a very vulnerable population. So the center is often the client in these briefs. For example, there's a case before the United States Supreme Court this session CIC Services, Inc., and it does involve an issue, namely micro-captive insurance corporations and IRS information gathering requirement that you disclose certain information, or else if you don't, you will receive a penalty, and CIC Services and others are challenging that requirement, saying it's overbroad and being threatened with a penalty. It's putting you in a place where In order to be able to litigate based on the IRS's positions, the merits of this information gathering, you have to either disclose the information that you're going to ultimately challenge doesn't need to be disclosed, or two, you have to incur a monetary penalty. And therefore, the case is basically saying, let us challenge this in court before we have to file a tax return. And let us challenge the government's basis for requiring this information. And is it overbroad, et cetera? And that does have implications for low-income taxpayers, that kind of information gathering technique, and for many other taxpayers. So there are a lot of amicus briefs filed in that case, but we filed one working with the Harvard Law School Low-Income Taxpayer Clinic with the center as a client, and we've really made our case for that. And that's up on our website, www.taxpayer-rights.org. We filed, I think, two others, one in the litigation dealing with the incarcerated economic impact payments. We filed one in a Second Circuit case that is dealing with the timeliness of certain filings and whether a time frame for filing 
a particular claim is jurisdictional, meaning if you miss it, you don't get to get into court? Or is it just procedural, which would allow the taxpayer to sort of explain why they missed it and then maybe still have their day in court? And we're working on one right now for a case which is challenging, and this might be of relevance to you all, is the requirement in the CARES Act that says that if a joint return includes a number that is not a working social security number, a social security number authorized for work, no one is eligible for the economic impact payment or the rebate recovery credit on that return. So one series of lawsuits has been brought by U.S. citizen spouses of persons who hold ITINs, who are undocumented, but in this country. And that's raising constitutional issues. No, it's the law rather than the prisoners, which the IRS just made this up out of, IRS and Treasury made this up out of whole cloth that they were ineligible. This is actually explicit in the law. And so we're working right now on an amicus brief on that issue. So there's another set of litigation, which is U.S. citizen children, ITIN holder parents. And again, that litigation is moving through the courts. And when it gets to the right point, we may very well file an amicus brief there. And people are already talking to us about other briefs. You know, our point is to raise taxpayer rights issues. And one thing I want to do is talk about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, even if there isn't any remedy for violations of Taxpayer Bill of Rights. I think it really is important to tie the principles of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights to other legal remedies that are available. So you start building out an understanding of what the right to privacy, the right to a fair and just tax system actually mean in the context of case law. So that's some of what we're trying to do. The center hosts workshops for taxpayer ombudsmen and advocates. What is the role of the taxpayer ombudsman? Do you have any workshops, virtual or in-person, coming up? It occurred to me that there are all sorts of ombudsmen coming out from all over the world. I've been working with several of them for the last 20 years, and I thought that the center was a very good vehicle for helping them get together. And that's both internationally, but also in the United States. Many of the tax agencies have state tax advocates. That's different from the local taxpayer advocate that's part of the taxpayer advocate service. And their authority and roles vary all over the place. So there were two things that we wanted to do. And one, I I have to get a move on and actually do it. On the domestic side, I talked to the Federation of Tax Administrators And we had agreed that they could host some calls with state taxpayer advocates. I've been thinking that the first one that would be really good just to have a conversation with them, you know, like a Zoom call or whatever, is to have people share what they're seeing in their communities and what relief is needed and what are they advocating for on the state tax agency side in terms of the coronavirus, economic consequences of the coronavirus. On the international side, I think the first time what we had been planning was a workshop in October, September, October this year, where international ombudsmen could get together or people who are interested in working toward establishing an ombudsman office could get together and really talk. We had done that in a couple of our international conferences informally, like having lunches just for the ombudsman to get together. And then going forward, in the international conferences, we will definitely have, we will have two workshops, basically. One will be with people who are interested in establishing low-income taxpayer clinic type programs in their country or who already have, and they're growing and they want to share their experience. And also a workshop or a breakfast or some kind of separate roundtable meeting for the ombudsman. I think that the conference is going to help create a vehicle for that on the international scale. In September, the center had a tax chat webinar. How did it go? Will you be having more webinars in the future? The tax chat was kind of, let's see what happens. Everybody's getting used to Zoom and we had to postpone our September slash October conference that we were going to have this year. So I thought, let's do the tax chat as 
a way to keep people connected. People were really missing that. And so we're going to do it monthly. It's kind of me opening up my Rolodex, although I know I'm dating myself because nobody has a Rolodex anymore, except maybe me, to invite various people in. I really want it to be a chat. I don't want it to be a formal presentation. I don't want PowerPoints. It's a conversation between me and people and the work that they're doing. So far, we've had two of them. I'm about to post the second one. The first one was with Philip Baker and Pasquale Pistoni talking about the International Observatory on the Protection of Taxpayer Rights. And I think it's a really fun conversation for people who care about taxpayer rights. And you can sort of sit back and let the two of them chat and not worry about anything. The second one we did was we had some of the folks from South Africa, the University of Pretoria and elsewhere who were my planning committee, if you will, most of them, many of them on the call. And we talked about taxpayer rights as human rights and as a vehicle to achieve sustainable development goals. And it was sort of, well, we can't be in South Africa right now because of the coronavirus, but let's have this chat. In another two weeks, I think it is, the week after the United States election, the Tuesday after the election, we're going to have a tax chat with three anthropologists who study tax and the anthropology of tax. I've been involved with a group of anthropologists who are very interested in various aspects of human behavior and taxation. Part of my idea is to bring people from different disciplines and different approaches to taxation and just have an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the questions of a chat, once a month occasionally. It might not, sometimes it's five weeks. We have a YouTube channel. They'll all be posted on the YouTube as well as on our website. And so people can see them and they are live. I mean, people can come on and sign up and ask questions and then I edit them and then we post it. Next May is the fifth international conference on taxpayer rights. And the sixth international conference is in October, 2021. Could you tell us more about these events? This was a continuation of the conference that I established as the National Taxpayer Advocate. And the idea was that the fifth one was going to be in South Africa, the end of September, beginning of October this year. But of course, no one could really travel. And we made the decision early on to postpone it. And we thought, let's just postpone it for a year. October in South Africa is really lovely. We'll just postpone it for a year. And in the back of my mind was thinking, who knows whether people are going to be willing to travel in the spring. We'll just have to see. But we had already scheduled the May 2021 conference in Athens. And the idea is that the international conferences would be on a three-year rotation. And we want to hold them in May of each year. Africa was sort of a little bit different just because of the timing of the seasons. One year it would be in the United States, one year it would be somewhere in Europe, and one year it would be anywhere else. 2021 was Europe, and we wanted to do it in Athens. And we just figured we'll schedule it for May, and then there's always the possibility that we'll have to be 100% virtual, or maybe it'll be partly virtual and partly in person. Some people may be able to get there, including speakers may participate through live streaming or it may be completely in person. Regardless, I think we'll have live streaming of the conference, even if we do it fully in person, because I do recognize by the end of May, even if there's a vaccine and everything like that, some people will not want to travel. The fifth conference is geared to audit procedures and transparency of information from the perspective of what can taxpayers find out about what their governments are doing. So a little bit of Freedom of Information Act focus, and then a concentration on audit techniques. And then, of course, the South Africa conference, again, is taxpayer rights as human rights as a means to achieve sustainable development goals. And that, that agenda is all planned and up on the website. And I hope to post by December the agenda for the Athens conference, which, like I say, will be available to people virtually, no matter what happens with the pandemic. So that's good news. That's an advance. 
Recently, you co-authored a piece of tax policy measures to combat the SARS COVID pandemic. Could you tell us a bit more about that work and the conclusions? This came out of a few ongoing conversations with Eric Kirkler, who just recently retired, actually, from the University of Vienna School of in Economics and Economic Psychology and Applied Psychology. And he's still teaching there, but he doesn't have the administrative positions. And we'd been having a conversation about, not so much about where we are today, but what happens after the pandemic. It sort of seemed to us that People were initially, because the pandemic was so severe, accepting of some of the things that governments were asking, and they had some patience. But as time goes on, hindsight is 2020, and people look back and say that's wrong, or they start resenting things, or they start seeing that they just start distrusting, or it's, the relief is not fast enough. We did a draft paper, and then we got other ec- economists to join in. And I have to say, I'm the odd person out because I'm not an economist. I'm not a psychologist. Eric is an economic psychologist. And we will be having Eric on the tax chat to talk a little bit about this. But I'm the one that just sits there and go, well, that's not administrable. No, you can't do that. Or what about this? Or what about this? I don't know what role I play in it, but I was there. And the paper came out and really tried to took a look at some of the activities and the actions that governments around the world had done and then tried to make some recommendations for what you need to do going forward. And obviously, as you're trying to recover and you're trying to put into place some procedures and also what can you expect from taxpayers in this post-COVID economy, things are very actually common sense, but it's surprising how hard common sense things are to actually implement. But we certainly were emphasizing transparency. You have to communicate, communicate, communicate with people. And you really have to share information and you have to provide services and you have to keep things as simple as possible and not put barriers in the way. You obviously have to continue to use penalties and to make sure if there are free riders or there are people abusing some of the provisions that come in that are the COVID kind of relief measures, there's always going to be abuse. People are going to need to see that the agencies are taking them on and not letting people escape that kind of thing. But at the same time, you can't take a shotgun approach to what you're doing and class everybody all into the same bucket. Like I say, it's very common sense, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it gets done. One of the points made in the piece is that citizens' trust and compliance increases in line with the perception that they're being treated fairly by the taxing authorities. Another point is made in regards to rewarding tax compliance, that using rewards for a good taxpayer can increase tax morale and compliance. Do you have any thoughts on how these relate to overseas American taxpayers? First of all, leaving aside, getting back, I'll get back to the rewards in a minute. The idea of of building citizen trust and compliance. I mean, I think you all know that as the IRS was rolling out the offshore voluntary disclosure initiatives, the IRS basically lumped everyone overseas, including U.S. citizens, into one bucket and treated taxpayers who were trying to comply, even though they may have made a mistake, the same as people who were actively evading taxes. And that approach just absolutely undermines compliance. It encourages people to make up their losses by being non-compliant going forward. And it increases the government's need to do enforced compliance rather than achieving voluntary compliance. And so part of what the paper said is there are ways in which you can recognize good, quote unquote, taxpayer behavior. One of the things that a lot of states and governments do when they have a a state sales tax or a value added tax is that they will give, if you will, a discount if you make payments by a certain time before the deadline. And that's rewarding Uber compliant behavior, if you will. Others are saying that you give them a certificate for recognition, or you can designate some entity as a good corporate citizen. 
Some of those proposals, you can just see them being tried in the United States, and I think they'd go nowhere. People would scream if the IRS did that, which is part of the problem with having different cultures, different country cultures. What you can do in one country, you may not be able to do in another. I think that there are ways of structuring things so that you recognize the compliant behavior of taxpayers. And it's interesting when I've had conversations with people in the IRS about this, the refrain always comes back, well, people are supposed to comply. And it's like, yeah, I know they're supposed to comply. But you go on and on and on about all the people who aren't complying. Wouldn't it be nice to recognize in some way the fact that people are complying? Because, you know, if everybody in the world decided that they weren't going to comply with the laws, you wouldn't be able to address that through the tools that you have today. You don't have enough people to enforce the laws. So you want to encourage voluntary compliance. So let's recognize it. In addition to the webinars and the conferences, do you have any other upcoming activities planned? In addition to what we were talking about of the amicus briefs and coordinating litigation, just recently I was asked to submit written testimony for congressional hearing. Another person has approached us about maybe doing some kind of a law journal in partnership with one of the law schools where the center could be the host of that journal. One thing that I'm very committed to, and this kind of ties to the Fifth International Conference, I have several draft FOIA requests for the IRS because having been in the IRS for 18 years, I do know what data it gathers. And now that I'm on the outside, I don't have access to that data. And it kind of drives me crazy. So I thought I could submit some FOIA requests to ask for basic taxpayer service data, CARES Act data, all sorts of stuff. And then obviously post it on the website. Or if they refuse to give it to me, then move forward with litigation on that. So that's sort of interesting. And I think if I get a spare moment, I'd really like to pursue that a bit. And I see that, again, as taxpayers have the right to be informed, that's the, in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights in the United States, that's the number one right. That's the first right. And that's because it's the starting point for all the other rights. If you don't know what the government is asking you to do in the way of guidance, if you don't know what the basis is for government actions, including why do they think this is a problem? What data do you have to support that? You won't be able to avail yourselves of the other rights. Could you tell us what challenges the IRS faces and what recommendations are out there to improve the service? The IRS started 2020 still recovering from the 2019 shutdown. And it got very far behind in so many things that it was doing and limited some of the initiatives that it was planning to do because it just couldn't do them after having had that shutdown. And so it starts 2020 trying to gear back up again. And very shortly after the filing season starts, it gets shut down again, literally everybody because of the pandemic. An economic impact payment, even in the best of times, I lived through 2008 and 2009, where you had the economic stimulus payment, and that created just so much more work for the IRS. And that was a very small scale, and you had a functioning IRS at that point and a larger budget at that point, inflation adjusted. When you try to do this in the midst of a pandemic, when your employees are not fully operable, you don't have phone service at all because nobody's telework and able to answer the calls from home. You can't open mail. You shut down the walk-in sites. The volunteer income tax assistance sites are closed. And it's just a mess. It's amazing that the IRS got the payments out that it did, but it's doing this in the midst of trying to plan for the next year's filing season and be prepared for the confusion that will happen when people try to reconcile on their 2020 returns, the payments that they got during 2020. Just based on 2008 and 2009, we know there's going to be a very large increase in errors on returns that will take a while to get resolved and they will need to be resolved before refunds are issued, which of course, anytime you delay somebody's refund, it's very anxiety creating. This is on top of the IRS trying to maintain an audit 
approach and a collection approach. And again, the thing that I'm worried about is you've got a pandemic economy. You don't even have a post-pandemic economy. And so how are you going to do collection in a pandemic economy? How is the IRS going about it? These are all the things that I think are the challenges for the IRS. And then last but not least, which certainly affects international taxpayers, is the abysmal state of the IRS information technology system, that you cannot in any easily way, email the IRS about your matters, that being able to sign on to the online account, which is very limited in its capacity, is a challenge because of the authentication factors. After having been there for almost two decades and seeing the difficulty that it has in achieving the simplest thing, I've really tried to give a lot of thought about how the IRS can do this. And Congress, in some ways, has taken my advice in requiring an IT strategic plan with annual updates and massive oversight. It does need funding, but it needs to put out a really credible plan so that Congress feels like it's not throwing money, good money after bad. You've held many international conferences on taxation and taxpayer rights. Do you see any trends and is there a gold standard out there for a service that is really meeting taxpayer needs? It's very difficult to to point to any one tax agency because as I've sort of said earlier, it so depends on the culture of the country and the culture of taxpayers. I spent a lot of time visiting in Scandinavia and in particular Sweden, meeting with tax officials there over the years when I was the national taxpayer advocate. And you would meet and they'd be doing amazing things. And then you'd be thinking, this is great, but I could never do this in the United States. People would look at this as suspicion. I could hear myself proposing it to the IRS and they'd think I was nuts. And on the other hand, people would in the United States who are very distrustful and dislike paying taxes, even though they are law abiding, they don't like paying taxes. And so you've got this distrust element there so that some of the things that you would like to do would be viewed as propaganda or something in the United States, whereas they'd be perfectly acceptable in another country. I think that there are pieces for any tax administration, you should view other tax administrations and what they're doing and then figure out what makes sense in your culture and also in the infrastructure that you have, because some countries can look at things and say, oh, I want all this stuff, but they don't have the infrastructure yet to support this stuff. And so if you bring it in, it's just going to fail. And that's not any good. And that's sort of what the point of the international conferences are, that people can share things. And in the course of the conversation, you can start saying this works. Now, I do think if you're interested in this, the International Bureau of Fiscal Documentation, IBFD, has on its website the Observatory on the Protection of Taxpayer Rights. And I serve on the supervisory board of that. And what it is is that there are reporters from different countries who each year report what's happening in about 12 different areas of taxpayer protection. For example, administrative appeals or what's happening in the area of penalties. And then you can see whether things have progressed or taken a few steps backward or stayed the same in these different countries. And also looking at it, if you read through the reports of these different countries, and they also have a general report where they discuss some of the highlights, you will see some things And I've read through going, oh, that's a really interesting approach. I think that's very interesting. So that's where I would point people to is looking at the observatory. And you can also, you know, all of the videos from the last four international conferences are up on our website. So you can listen to various panels. We've had penalty panels. We've had panels on appeals. We've had panels on all sorts of issues. And you can listen to people from all over the world talk about what's happening in their countries. Lastly, do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, I just want to thank all of the American citizens abroad for their patience over the years and also to acknowledge the important work that ACA has been doing, because particularly with the offshore programs, as this sort of regime came down and made no distinction between the types of taxpayers who were overseas that you had compliance concerns about. You were so vocal and helpful in bringing attention 
to these matters. And it actually enabled me and my staff at that time to write pieces in the annual report to Congress and make legislative recommendations and discuss this at congressional hearings and put pressure on the IRS to change these processes. And I don't in any way think we're done with that work, but I really appreciate the work that you've done and that I greatly benefited from as the national taxpayer advocate. So I guess that what I would like to say to you all is thank you. Thank you, Nina, for joining us today. The American Citizens Abroad podcast is a monthly podcast that is published the second Tuesday of each month. It is edited and produced by me, Michelle, and is a product of American Citizens Abroad. You can find us on Twitter at ACA underscore podcast, on Facebook at American Citizens Abroad podcast, or you can email us at podcast at americansabroad.org. Remember, give us a good rating on Apple Podcasts so other Americans living abroad can find us. 